the church in the modern world, which says that the anxiety, the grief, and the suffering of the people of the world, these also are the grief, anxiety, and suffering of all followers of Christ. And Pope Francis would say, and not only followers of Christ, but of all people. So in order to bring the timeless truth of the gospel, our faith and tradition then seek to translate this into public space and into society. The first formal example of this was the encyclical of Pope Leo XIII in 1891, Relum Novarum. This basically coincided with the Industrial Revolution. At a time when industrial economy was only a century old and posed many dilemmas and problems for workers and their families, Pope Leo XIII sought to respond to the very many new challenges and experiences of society with, again, a reflection from the point of view of the gospel faith. The most recent instance of doing this is what we gathered this tonight to consider, the publication of La Dato Si by Pope Francis uh, this past June uh, in the Vatican. And again, Pope Francis is responding to the new developments in society by shedding the light of faith on the new experiences that we're facing. So to give this lecture is an example of what our department in the Roman Curia in Rome seeks to assist Pope Francis with. At the same time, as uh, Professor Wall said, I'm invited here to St. Thomas v. Villanova, and by the fact that this is taking place within a church and not in some auditorium and all, to also offer a Lenten reflection. This is a moment then of spiritual deepening on our pilgrimage during the Jubilee Year of Mercy and in this period of Lent. Towards then the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ. And so I'm also delighted with the title that you have chosen, Care of Creation as a Work of Mercy. It really helps us to explore a most relevant theme, and that is how to live our faith in the world in such a way that it corresponds to God's design for creation and for the life of the of hu uh, human family. So here essentially are five points which I would like to uh, you know, uh, take up tonight briefly. And it is about this, you know, so what is creation? And what is care of creation which the Holy Father invites us to exercise? And for the purposes of this evening, what is mercy? And the declaration of Jubilee Year of Mercy by Pope Francis. This I'll certainly not go into details with because I, I, I leave that to your pastors and your parish priests to be able to, to present why we celebrate in the year, Jubilee Year of Mercy in the church. That is something that should be happening in every parish. And then from there, we're going to see how do the works of mercy help us to live the Jubilee Year of Mercy here in Philadelphia, and if even you want, on this campus of Villanova University. But first, if the clip is ready, first Pope Francis himself offers us the core message of this encyclical that we gathered here to consider tonight in a very short video, about a minute and a half. And if it is ready, I'd like to invite you to watch it. Creyentes y no creyentes, estamos de acuerdo en que la tierra es una herencia común cuyos frutos deben beneficiar a todos. Sin embargo, ¿qué pasa en el mundo donde vivimos?
La relación entre la pobreza y la fragilidad del planeta requiere otro modo de ejercer la economía y el progreso concibiendo un nuevo estilo de vida. Porque necesitamos una conversión que nos una a todos. Liberarnos de la esclavitud del consumismo. Y este mes te hago una petición especial. Que cuidemos de la creación recibida como un don que hay que cultivar y proteger para las generaciones futuras. Cuidar la casa común. So, my dear uh, brothers and sisters, having seen the video, we are now ready to, we are ready for our Lenten reflection on the care of creation as a work of mercy. So first, what is creation? And what is create the Creator God and His work of creation? Let us meditate briefly on God's basic relationship with all that he has made. In our tradition, our biblical tradition, Judeo-Christian tradition, the human story begins in an orderly fashion within the story of the beginning of everything. An orderly, as orderly as the days of the week, God creates nature, inanimate, and then animate beings, in the first five days, and then humanity on the sixth day. So, if you want, we ask him then about God's design for everything that he designed and wanted to create. Human story then is not part, it's not apart from the rest of nature. Humanity and nature are integrated. And as the video we just saw showed, our nature is created by God and surrounded by the gifts of creation. An account of this for Benedict is used to say in that the book of nature is one. We're not dealing with two things, elements created by God, here the human family and nature, but it is one book, inseparable, interdependent, and interrelated. So the biblical narrative then teaches us that human life is grounded in three fundamental and closely related and intertwined relationships with God, with our neighbor, and with the earth. When one of these relationships is broken, the other two are also broken. And our insertion in the universe is no longer integral nor harmonious. It is fractured and it becomes partial. In the second chapter then of Lord Out to Sea, Pope Francis articulates the tremendous responsibility of humankind for creation. And this natural environment is a collective good the patrimony of all of humanity and the responsibility of everyone. And so this collective good and this responsibility of all underpin the insistent message about the moral dimension of how we treat nature and the rest of creation. For creation is the order of love. It is a loving gift from God. It is not some arbitrary display of manifestation of omnipotence, but it's God's love which enfolds us and all things which he created. So creation essentially is a gift of God to humanity. And human life draws from creation and is related to it. Our bodies are drawn from the earth. They are sustained by the products of the earth. The air we breathe is part of what God has created. And 
When we do die, we do return to what God has created. Of course, for us Christians, we know that the resurrection of Jesus has transformed us. In the account of creation, everything that God created, the drama of creation ended with, dust you are, and unto dust you shall return. Till Jesus comes and takes up this dust, takes it into death and raises it up from the death and transforms the destiny of this death. So that after Jesus and his resurrection, the story is no more, dust you are, and unto dust you shall return. But it is dust we are, and in the resurrection of Jesus, we shall be raised into glory. So for us then, as it were, the reading of the Old Testament doesn't find its complete meaning until we bring it to the New Testament and to what Jesus does to everything that exists in the Old Testament. But I will not go into that tonight. We need to make time for you to ask a lot of questions at the end, so I'll be very brief. And I'll try to, I'll try to control my asides because that's, that's, that's my weakness. So, my dear friends, the biblical narrative then tells us that human life is grounded in three relationships which we've talked about. The natural environment then is a collective good, the patrimony of humanity and the responsibility of every one of us. This collective good and this responsibility of all underpin the insistent message about the moral dimension of how we treat nature and the rest of creation. But the relationship with nature does not stand alone. It is intertwined with the other two dimensions. In the Bible, God who liberates and saves is the same God who created the universe. And these two divine ways of acting are intimately and inseparably connected. The story of creation is central for reflecting on the relationship between the human beings and other creatures. And that story is not static. The story of creation continues today, and our human engagement in it has failed to incorporate with God's design. And as Pope Francis writes, the violence present in our hearts, wounded by sin, is also reflected in the symptoms of sickness, evident in the soil, in the water, in the air, and all forms of life around us. This is why the earth herself burdened and laid waste is among the most abandoned and maltreated of all poor elements on the earth. So the earth is groaning, is groaning on account of the sins of men or the sins of humanity as the prophet Isaiah would write. And so again, as the video showed, we overconsume and we do not share the gifts of creation. We have told much and we have kept very little. At creation, God entrusted the earth to us and he said, till and keep it. We have overtilled and we have kept very little. And the earth now begins to grow, according to Pope Francis. So this being the situation, Pope Francis began his ministry by describing two fragilities. One fragility was the present state of the earth, present state of the creation, which suffering from abusive treatment and exploitation and all of that, is according to Pope Francis, very fragile, very poor, and crying to us to be heard. So in the encyclical, he says that the earth, our sister and our mother, is crying to us. The second fragility is the excluded among, you know, among, among us. So um, he excluded among you know, the class of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the human family. The very many who live on the periphery, the poor ones, the excluded, and those who live on the fringes of society and the poor ones. So these two fragilities occupy the mind of Pope Francis, and they will be, as it were, the underlying trust and basis for this encyclical. It's written then to respond to these two basic fragilities, the earth as it is now, abused, and the human, the poor ones uh, in our midst. This being the case, what and what is the form that our care for creation can take? 
At the first mass of his uh, enthronement as, uh, as, as Pope, Pope Francis celebrated the mass of St. Joseph. And then from reflecting on the role of Joseph in the Holy Family, the Holy Father, Pope Francis, went on to say that, may God help all of us to assume the role of Joseph being protectors and stewards of creation and everything that God has entrusted into our hands. So as it were, making Joseph a model for us in our care, in our, in our uh, stewardship, if you want, and care of everything God has created. So we often told to be good stewards of creation. But a major surprise in this encyclical is that Pope Francis talks about stewardship only twice. Everything in this encyclical, the relationship between human beings and the earth is all expressed in terms of care. Care for creation, care for everything that God has made. Clearly, when one cares for something, he does with, with more passion, with more commitment, and with his whole heart and soul. Stewardship expresses our responsibility towards the earth, but it can also be done dispassionately. And so, Pope Francis preferred the expression, care, instead of stewardship. <clears throat> so, good stewards take responsibility and fulfill the obligations to manage and to render an account. Yet the term appears only twice. For one can be a good steward without feeling connected. And beyond jobs and accountability, care is a more intimate, an expression of more intimate relationship. It comes up dozens of times, for if one cares, then one is truly connected. And to care is to allow oneself to be affected by the other. In a, in a way then, preparing to what we shall be talking about as mercy, it's a way that we gradually learn to share the suffering of the other. Good parents know this very well. You care about your children and you care for your children so much so that parents will sacrifice enormously even their own lives to ensure the safety and the flourishing of their children. As our own parents did for us, with carrying the hard line between self and the other softens and even fades away. It blurs even and sometimes even completely disappears. St. Francis of Assisi is our model in this regard. He integrated the human and the natural, creation and the spirit together. And so, Pope Francis proposes that we think about our relationship with the world and with all people in terms of caring. And so, he illustrates this with the example of Jesus and the parable of the Good Samaritan as an instance of this. Therefore, having explored creation and the sense of caring, as the Pope invites us to do in response to his identification of the two fragilities, he would invite us to develop a real sense of tenderness to be able to listen to the cry of the fragile elements in our world. So fragility on the part of Francis corresponds to tenderness of heart on the part of all of us. And this is the predisposition, as it were, in this encyclical for us to be able to listen to the cry of creation, the cry of all the poor, and the cry of all who are groaning around us. Therefore, coming to consider all of this in terms of works of mercy, mercy is an English word. You know it better than I do. I learned English. I wasn't, it wasn't my mother, you know, it wasn't my mother tongue. I learned it a little bit, you know, and you know, I, I learned English from Dutch people. So, so the guys who taught us English in the assembly were from Holland. And so a Dutch man teaching you English, he teaches you. <laughs> so, <laughs> no offense to all Dutch, <laughs> Dutch <men. laughs> So, you know, you know, mercy derives from the Latin word merces, okay, or merces, which means reward, gratuity. And we see this meaning in the French expression merci. Okay, merci is when one thanks somebody for a favor or something done. So it is courtesy that graces our social interactions with a touch of kindness. In English, then, 
Mercy can take on the theological sense even in secular contexts. God's grace comes to us as an unmerited gift. And to be merciful then is freely to offer clemency to someone worthy of punishment or to even to release someone from a debt that he or she owes. Therefore, there are very many who are interested in classic, classics and classical literature. You will probably remember the book of Shakespeare, The Merchant of Venice. In there, Shakespeare writes, the quality of mercy is now strained. It drops as a gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath and enables us to be merciful. So such mercy then restrains the hand that would punish and gratuitously sets us free. That's how God acts towards us. Such mercy comes from above like a summer shower and it comes from outside us. Such mercy then forgives, it restores and it sets right again. It is what essentially is the soul of reconciliation. But even more than gift, merit and grace and the forgiveness of debt, mercy has a whole other meaning which becomes clear when you look at the Latin translation where mercy becomes misericordia, a heart for the miserable, a heart for the poor, a heart for the weak, and a heart for the one who is suffering. So the Latin word for compassion or literally having a heart for those who are miserable, poor, and in need is what inspires our reflection. Here we speak then of an emotional state of entering into someone else's plight, entering into someone else's burden, and being able to share the pain of another. In the parable of the prodigal son, we see this. When the father welcomed the son, who went and dissipated his wealth and then came back, it was the father sharing uh, the state of the son. And so it is. And the contrast is the attitude of the father and the attitude of the eldest son. While the father can share and enter into the state of the son, the elder son is not able to do this. And in some other context, we'll probably then ask a question. How come a son of a father is not capable of the sentiments of a father? So how can a son be so dissimilar in attitude and conduct to a father? And so have this, as it were, divergent attitude. So let's just keep in mind both kinds of mercy, the forgiving kind like the rain from above and the compassionate kind like a spring from within, which enables us to enter into the state and the condition of another. So with this in mind then, and knowing what the care of creation is, let us now seek to respond to what Villanova wants us to consider as our Lenten exercise. How then can the care of creation be an act of mercy for all of us? You may then remember the works of mercy from your catechism. You were told to look at a you know, list from the Bible. I'm not going to hold you accountable to that. Or, uh, you know, uh, uh, this is a place of learning, but we're not learning or doing any test tonight. It's something just to refresh your memory. In the past, it used to be one of the things that was required of everybody who wanted to be baptized or to be confirmed. But times have changed, and it may not quite be the same. And in any case, if you, if you know the works of mercy, they're also going to be the point of reference of everything that we'll be doing uh, you know, uh, tonight uh, you know, here together. And so... These works of mercy, perhaps some aspects could be still translated for our situation, for our society. It is such a better translation inspired by Lord to see that I would like to share with you this evening some, of, some parts of them. So we know there are seven corporal works of mercy, just as there are seven spiritual works of mercy. The seven corporal works of mercy invite us to consider care, for one another, 
and care for the weak, to feed the hungry, the type of things that you like also to read in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 25. And then there's the spiritual works of mercy, which also comes up and invites us to be considered. When you consider all of those works of mercy, they invite us to be able to enter into the situation of the other. And wanting to reflect all of this as an instance of you know, uh, works of mercy, there is one expression which enables us to do this very, very, very effectively. And it is the expression of solidarity. Solidarity is an expression which Pope John Paul II made very popular. But solidarity is something that, having made, uh, having, having made it popular, he then go on to say, it is just not a vague feeling of, 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 uh, of uh, you know, uh, a vague feeling of compassion, but a firm and a persevering determination to commit oneself to the common good of the other. If we take this to be the sense of solidarity, not simply a vague you know, feeling of compassion, but a persevering commitment for, to realize the well-being of the other person. Then in this case, solidarity would, would invite us then to commit to the realization of the well-being of the planet Earth, creation then, and of everybody else who lives on this planet. It becomes an obligation on, on the part of all of us. A sense of solidarity becomes a very concrete response on, on, on the part of all of us in our attempt to be merciful towards everything that is around us. If mercy is having a, a heart for the suffering, for the poor and the needy, then solidarity is a concrete response to this. When we are solidary with something or with somebody, as for uh, you know, uh, uh, John Paul developed in great detail, to the point of calling solidarity a virtue, then it is that persistent and committed effort on our part to work for the realization of the common good of the other. In this case, the earth or the other poor needy ones among us. So this, as it were, in some Christian settings will become what we call a theological option for the poor. But with whether, however we refer to it, the sense of solidarity becomes a very crucial expression which enables us to respond to what we're discussing tonight. How does, is our, does our care for creation become an act of mercy? And I simply want to provide a, a, the answer, a simple answer saying, it becomes a work of mercy to the extent that we embrace this virtue of solidarity. When we embrace this virtue of solidarity, which commits and invites us to work for the well-being, the common good of the earth and all, the poor and whatever, every part of it, then we solidarity with them. Then we have a heart and we share the experience and the situation of all of them. Therefore, going through all the seven and the seven corporal works of mercy, seven spiritual works of mercy, what the funnel, as it were, the, 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 the convex lens that we place before them to bring them all to a focus is the expression of solidarity, which invites us to be committed to the realization of the well-being of the other. And if the suffering other is the earth creation, then it is for its common good that we commit ourselves. If it be for the poor, the needy in our society, then it is for their well-being that we commit ourselves. So Pope, Pope John Paul II embraced this expression and made it very, very popular. So with renewed vigor, he would say, in our own time, the church focuses on this effort and to respond to the call of its founder then through the virtue of uh, solidarity to have a preferential option for all the needy elements in our midst and in our society. The church continues to solicit and to channel the goodwill, the talents and the resources for, of its members in that direction, mindful of the command of its founder who chose to identify himself with the needy, the thirsty, the hungry, the homeless, and the poor. And this close and constant proximity to the poor and suffering of the world is the church's solidarity 
an affective respect for the human family and for creation. And if tonight we need to consider this briefly, this is the expression and this is the key expression I want to leave you with. We respond to the care for creation as a work of mercy by embracing the virtue of solidarity, which invites us and enables us to share and enter the situation of all what, uh, of those who are suffering and everything that is suffering, so that we get committed and persistently pursue the well-being of all these suffering elements that are around us. And briefly with this, I'd like to probably stop over here, make room for some, from, for, 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 for some more, for some more, uh, for whatever questions and everything that we may have. This expression, some argue, was an expression which was very popular with the Soredanos, this movement in Poland. Before this movement in Poland, Soredanos wasn't a popular church expression and language. Pope John Paul II took it from this movement and if you want to Christianize it or baptize it, make it an, making it an expression of all who commit themselves to pursuing the well-being of the other or the other element. And from that moment went on to say it is a virtue. It's not simply an element or simply a moral social trust, but he calls it a virtue. And if it's a virtue, then it's a simple something that we're able to do with the grace of God. And through the grace of God then, we as it were enabled and empowered to commit ourselves to the pursuit and to working for the well-being of the other, be this other our created world, or be this other the poor and the neglected elements in our midst and in our society. So, if the question is, how can we make louder to see and it's called for care of creation and work of mercy, then my brief answer tonight is that it will be through the practice of the virtue of solidarity which makes us all commit to the well-being of all the weak and the needy ones in our midst and around us. Thank you. If people wanted to ask a question, maybe then I'll bring the microphone to you. If you raise your hand. Uh, does the Pope see an economic model in that combination with that for the better distribution of water? But it seems that he wants everybody to have completely free access to water. The Pope does. And, okay. <laughs> the Pope does and we pursue that. We, we, we've developed a small study of that. Okay, the right and, you know, access to water. In all the UN documents, the talk is about access to water. We think that we should probably start talking about right to water, okay, which will change the whole discourse. Okay, the whole talk and, you know, about water, access to water is just, you know, make it available you know, for people. But when it becomes a right to water, then it is something that, you know, has to be, has to be pursued. Governments will have to, you know, commit themselves to it because otherwise they can be accused of, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, disregard of, you know, uh, human rights and all of that. So yes, the Pope talks about it, and what does he do? A whole lot of this and he passes it on to us. Every now and then, every now and then, you know, uh, uh, a police officer or gendarme or somebody from the fire department of the Vatican, you know, arrives at our office, rings the bell, and has a document that he will not give to anybody except to me, and then you turn it and you say, from Papa Francesco. Okay, what is it? Pope Francis has chosen a lifestyle which, which, which means he's not interested in building a library. Okay? Living in Santa Marta, having a bedroom and a study, building a library is not, it's not, it's not, it's not a thing that he wants to do. So very many of the time that passed to him comes to us. And so a lot of literature on water comes to us. There have been proposals about desalination as a, as a, as a way of produ providing this and then. Happily, here in your engineering department, uh, your students are engaging, you know, 
uh, helping provide you know, uh, clean portable water for people. And I think they're also active in Ghana in this regard, you know, working, working, working on this. this. This is crucial. So crucial that we, from our office, from a small study we're able to do, sometimes talk about the fact that the, less, the next world war may well be provoked by water and access to water. Because it's the one thing that we're running gradual and short supply of. But it's also the one thing that we cannot. Next to air is the one thing that we, can, we cannot live you know, uh, without. So it, it is, it, it is, it is, it is a, it's a very serious thing. Okay, and that's, that's my jealousy for, you know, for those in the Northern Hemisphere because wherever you have snow, you have water. So if you live in a land where it snows, you don't worry about water. You have it. If you live in a land that is snow, where the sun is all of that. So, so, this is the thing. so the water issue is very crucial. There's a talk about a layer of water under the Sahara, which at one point was being stay, uh, you know, uh, seriously studied so it could solve the problem of the Sahara. But then everything, everything you know, this day becomes, you know, ex, ex, you know, developing that or bringing that water as a question of, you know, technology and therefore finance. And when there's no profit to gain, stuff like that doesn't easily get done. Okay, unless again it becomes a big humanitarian, you know, gesture act. But it's something that, you know, the Holy Father thinks about. Yes. You spoke about uh, the cultivating this care rather than stewardship and just talking about how that um, really shows that somebody has a dedication and a passion um, for the care of creation. And I was just wondering if you could sort of speak to how you sort of got involved in um, this just spiritual connection to creation, if you had any um, advice for all of us here about how we can sort of cultivate that in ourselves. <laughs> how I got... <laughs> how, how, how I got into uh, this, uh, the draft of the encyclical? Or the, uh, how I got into... Yeah, I'm sorry, just sort of your connection to creation sort of spiritually and uh. how you've gotten into that. Spiritual too. <laughs> no, it is, it, it is this. I grew up in a mining town. I grew up in a manganese mining town. It was not a shaft mining. It was strip mining. So it meant that the forest would go, the topsoil would go, so they can get access to the ore. So the result of it is that you have bare heights or craters, okay, where the ore is mined. So growing up, that's the world I grew up, you know, in. You know, seeing all of these barren heights and all of that. Yet, having people who needed to supplement their salary by farming. Okay, and so, and so what we realized increasing was that the distances to the farm kept getting longer and longer and longer. Okay, as, as we had to move away, you know, uh, to places to farm because of everything else that was happening over there. So, so that was my first experience about the tensions between, if you want land use, okay, land use for mining and land use for agriculture, and the need for a balance to be established. Where does the balance come from? In situations like ours and several other situations in developing countries, these mining companies come and they go to the government. In Ghana, where I come from, the law, the law says that, you know, the land is normally vested in families, in clans, and in stools, okay? So the law says that if you own a land, you own only the surface. Whatever is found inside in the earth belongs to the state, okay? So if a family or a clan or a tribe owns any portion of land, he owns only the surface. If there's any mineral found inside in that land, it belongs to the state. So you can be sitting on your land 
when a state or the government signs a document for somebody to come and prospect or look for minerals or whatever on your land, sometime without your consent. This is going to develop a lot of fights, okay, uh, you know, in, in, in our communities, and we're trying to work on that. Happily, being where I am now, we've managed to establish ties with CEO of mining companies. We've met with them twice, in 2013 and last September. We're trying to engage the CEOs in a discussion to enable them to see some of these principles we talk about, like common good, the universal destination of the goods of the earth, if God designed the goods of the earth for all, then it's not, it's not fair that one company or whatever group appropriates everything uh, to the exclusion of the other. So we engage them in such a discussion. And it is becoming useful because where the local communities don't have a voice to talk to these CEOs, the fact that somebody in the Vatican invites them and they come enables us to engage them and prepare them to listen to uh, the communities and groups down there. So that's how the, the, the need to care for creation comes up, and that's where the need to care doesn't have to be one-sided, okay? But it has to be something that respects this principle of the universal destination of the goods of the earth. Something that is a common good must be preserved for all. And we must, you know, your engineering students came up with a nice expression, no? Uh, for, for, for everyone and forever. Enough for all and for, uh, you know, enough for everyone and forever. So that is their way of expressing sustainability, okay? That, that, that's a, so I, I already, you know, registered, you know, to be admitted to that course. That's why I already know what they talk about. Yeah, go ahead, sir. He wants to come back and study engineering here. <laughs> it's true. Any other questions? Yes. I, I speak out of a concern for population control. Uh, you made reference eloquently to uh, Isaiah. Uh, I think at the time of Jesus, the population on planet Earth was estimated to be about 20 million, which probably, if I speculate, may mean at the time of Isaiah it was about 10 million. But anyway, one way or the other. The population of the planet is now 7 million, 7 billion, excuse me. And within uh, 30 years, it's predicted to be 9 billion. You know, that, that's an enormous problem. You know, the predictions, of course, of Malthus you know, from over a century ago, uh, have, not be, have not come to fruition. But, uh, but the question becomes, how much of a population can the Earth stand? You know, it certainly has withstood much more than people ever thought was possible. But eventually there'll be limits, and there was an implication of that in, in your talk. What are we supposed to do about population control? Mm -hmm. So basically the question is, uh, What, uh, what is the volume of population that the earth or the goods of the earth can you know, support and sustain at, you know, at, at one point? Okay, and you know, as again, this is a university, as you know, the Malthusian principle that relates population growth with development is something that has come under a lot of pressure and a lot of you know, questions. For example, you know, I, I give to, I, I'll answer briefly, you know, two ways, a very brief one and probably a you know, longer one. In 2010, I led a delegation to the United Nations to discuss the Millennium Development Goals. And my point was that the way of dealing with poverty is not to eliminate the poor, but to invest in the resourcefulness of the poor. And something similar has to do with, again, the argument has been advanced before that the population of the Earth is increasing. Is the Earth capable? of supporting this you know, uncontrolled growth of population on the face of the earth. Well, from what we see now, from what we see now, if the resources available to humanity now was equitably distributed, there will be no poor one in our midst. So the earth is capable of sustaining and supporting all the population we have. 
just that there's inequality and inequity in the distribution of the resources of the year. Just at the last uh, well, the World Economic Forum in Davos, just past January, Oxfam publishes report again. Last year it did. Last year it said that the, the, the wealth of, uh, you know, the, the world's wealth is concentrated in the hands of, you know, 2%. Okay, of, 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 the, of, the, of, of people. This year, it went to 1%. Now, if 90% if, 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 if of the wealth of the world is considered in the hands of 1% of us on earth, then if that 1% kind of made, if you want, the net that it holds bigger, for a lot of things to flow out, then there will be, there will be less need on the face of the earth. So it's a question whose answer requires a certain amount of change of attitude, lifestyle, or if you want, even change of morale, in the sense that, you know, this is a law of nature. Any accumulation of any element at one part creates scarcity on the other part. And that's what we experience in our world now. There is an accumulation of the resources of the earth in one part or one region of the earth, creating therefore the need and the deficiency in other parts of the earth. And that gives the impression that, you know, with this or with the, with the mass of poor, whatever people, it just means that we need to decrease the population, you know, uh, but that's not the solution. I think the solution is that we need to recognize this basic principle of the church, the universal destination of the goods of the earth. The goods of the earth were meant for all. It wasn't meant for a few. And if by business, you know, whatever thing people get, you know, whatever type of thing, you know, a certain, a certain amount of, you know, the Germans will say, no, no, we're not speaking German. A certain, a certain amount of uh, feeling, you know, uh, compassion for, for the other should, should, should allow people to share a little bit. The concentration of wealth in the hands of few is one of our biggest problems. So, yes, I've heard people you know, address the same question by saying, therefore, control bad, control population growth. So introduce bad controls and contraception and all of those so that you know, population is controlled and so the resources of the earth can better you know, uh, serve the needs of humanity. We can control population all we want, but if this attitude of accumulating wealth by few does not change, we will never. We will always have the, you know, the, the state of poor ones, despite the fact that we control and control and control population. So what has to change is people recognizing that the goods of the earth were meant for all. We're here in the United States, huh, and you probably know a story from close by here. Some of you may probably be from Boston or may have lived in Boston before. You know the story of the Boston Commons. You've heard that before? There is a story that in the past, in Boston, there were you know, acres of you know, land left for cattle to graze on. Everybody's cattle, therefore, could go and graze on that property. Till some, knowing that, began to increase their ownership of cattle to the extent that they, you know, the thing didn't, was not enough then for everybody. And that made, that made it necessary for them to introduce rules to regulate how many cattle each one can have to be able to graze on the Boston Commons. That's, it's, 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 the same, it's the same thing that keeps happening all the time. When, when people begin to amass and to accumulate, then there's a shortage created, and then people suffer from this shortage, and they become poor. So at a certain point, the challenge, I think, is that we need to recognize that, you know, uh, God who created the world created that well for the well being of all. So the universal destination of the goods of the earth and the common good of all is a thing probably to talk about. I could just follow up. My question was posed kind of anthropocentrically and, and you answered it really in those terms. But the other question is about what about the lions and the tigers and the whales and the elephants? They, they, are, they are losing uh, habitat land constantly, and many of these species are threatened with uh, extinction. You know, what mm. obligation do we have there? Yeah, that's a, that, uh, okay, so fine. I limited it to essential human beings, but I didn't include the animal world and all of those. Yeah, you could, you could, you could, you could talk about those. 
the, the, the human activity can sometimes also lead to the whatever, shortage of uh, if your habitat, you know, if you want. There is the need for us to also respect biodiversity. Biodiversity in the sense of, you know, that our land use should not be at the detriment of other animals and other species whose lives also depend on this. And what is happening? Again, because of the big need for flowers in Europe, in places where we know there are big, you know, uh, game farms, Kenya, Tanzania, whatever, the mountain slopes are bought by very rich whatever, whatever, and instead of these becoming habitats or grazing ground for the animals, they become flower gardens. So that every morning the plane leaves for Europe with flowers. For that's an option. People have chosen to drive away the animals from the land and put it to the growth and development of flowers. Is that a priority? Is that the thing that we want? So uh, a lot of it is, a, is, 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 is a human choices. And our choices which need to be well informed by certain basic needs and basic principles. With that, I think we'll uh, bring the question and answer to conclusion. Don't go away, my friend, please. <laughs> it's just getting really good now. No. Okay. Um, but uh, again, thank you all. We're going to uh, take this time. I'd ask Father Peter Donahue to come up. And uh, this is... Uh, it's transformed, too. It's transformed, too. It's yes. transformed. I changed. <laughs> His Eminence, Cardinal Peter Turkson, was born on October 11, 1948, in western region of Ghana, Africa. He was ordained to the priesthood in 1975 in the Cathedral of St. Francis de Sales in Cape Coast, Ghana. Eighteen years later, in 1993, in the same cathedral, he was ordained and installed as the Archbishop of Cape Coast. Ten short years afterwards, on September 28th, 2003, Pope John Paul II named him to the Sacred College of Cardinals. As the Archbishop of Cape Coast, His Eminence was president of the Ghana Catholic Bishops Conference, the Chancellor of a Catholic University of Ghana, and appointed a member of several institutions at the Roman Curia. Throughout his years as an Archbishop and as a Cardinal, he has received numerous honors and awards, including honor honorary degrees from several other universities. We are not the first. <laughs> He is the recipient of the Order of Star, a national honor of the Republic of Ghana, and the Order of Rock from the traditional area of central Ghana. In March of 2011, Cardinal Turkson visited Villanova University as a participant in the Conference on Catholic Social Thought and Global Poverty, which was sponsored by the Office of Mission and Ministry. Then, as now, he has been a constant voice for social and in integral human development to the poor. To quote Cardinal Turkson, the just person is the one who therefore preserves communion with God, with neighbor, and with the land, and by so doing also makes peace. For your faithful service to the Roman Catholic Church in Ghana and to the World Church, for your extraordinary commitment to the work for the interfaith dialogue, and for your constant prophetic voice for all the world's poor and the preservation of all God's creature, I, in the name of the Board of Trustees and Faculty of Villanova University, confer upon you, Cardinal Peter Turkson, the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters, honoris causa. I could uh, 
You know, uh, it invites the heads of the Dicassians together. And for those sessions, we're all supposed to go in Kasak. So the next time we go in for such a meeting, I'm going <laughs> I think, I think I'll throw this on and then say, I said, I said the University of Illinois asked ask me to bring this to him for, for the production of the encyclical loud out to see, and then see what his reaction would be. But I want to, I want to, I want to sincerely thank you, uh, you know, Father, President of this university, the Vice, all of you, you know, uh, deans and lecturers of this university, and the staff and students and all, uh, for this uh, distinguished honor. Uh, that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that you've done me. And uh, when, 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 when I get some chance to do sabbatical, <laughs> I come and re register to do some courses over here. But I want to thank you all, thank you, Father, for this honor and uh, prayer for wishes for God's blessings on everything that you do here. Thank you. Thank you.